CNN Salma Abdelaziz joining us now with the latest. Uh, Salma, Gaza's hospital are facing, um, the hospitals there, they're facing severe shortages and of course there's no fuel on these aid trucks. What more can you tell us about the, the aid that's coming in and how that is going to play out? I think it's crucial we put this aid into context. We understand from local officials that these 20 trucks are 3%, just 3% of what was normally coming in on a single day in Gaza before this crisis even began. And these trucks have to distribute this aid as airstrikes continue to rain down without fuel to... Uh, put into these trucks and they're filling this huge gap, this huge def deficit. Hospitals are running out of medicine. Kids are drinking seawater because there's no clean drinking water. The humanitarian crisis is just huge. I want to I want you to take a look at the situation on the ground. I do warn you, these images are graphic as these aid convoys enter Gaza. <laughs> Hospitals in Gaza are crumbling. Everything is running out from surgical equipment to medicine. And the tiniest lives are left hanging in the balance. We need power. We need access to clean water. This doctor says without basic services, this will be a humanitarian catastrophe. Already, seven hospitals and 21 primary health care facilities here are out of service, according to Palestinian officials, because of shortages. After intense diplomatic efforts, prayers of relief at the Rafah border crossing, as a trickle of aid was allowed in from Egypt. But the 20-truck convoy is only a drop in the ocean of need here, equivalent to just 3 percent of what entered this enclave daily prior to the conflict. More than 200 additional trucks of assistance remain stalled on the Egyptian side, according to the UN, and every hour costs lives. And so far, no civilians can leave the enclave. Ten-year-old Palestinian-American Aiden is among those trapped. And we had no place to go. All the streets are bombed. They're, they're literally gone. How are we supposed to go out? Um, how? It's all closed. Even if people are allowed out, it will be a limited number, most likely only those with foreign passports, sealing some two million others, half of them children, into this hellscape. But some refuse to go, even if they could, fearing Israel intends to bomb and besiege them out of their homes, never to return. Even as Mahmoud buries his children, he says he will keep fighting just to exist here. We will still be patient. As long as we are alive on this earth, we will be patient. He says we will never leave this land. After the October 7th terror attacks, when Hamas killed more than 1,400 people in Israel in a brutal surprise incursion, Israel vowed to wipe out Hamas. But with hundreds of airstrikes pounding the densely populated enclave a day, innocent blood is being spilled. Innocent children were struck down while they were sleeping. This woman shouts, what did they do? Did they carry weapons? These are innocent children who know nothing. Tell us, when will this end? There are calls for a ceasefire to get civilians out of the war zone and allow more aid into Gaza. But the pleas fall on deaf ears so far. Israel is preparing for the next phase of its operations, a potential ground incursion that can only bring more suffering. Now, when we talk about this trickle of aid, I also want you to think about just how much it required to get such a small amount of help into the enclave. President Biden was directly involved in these negotiations. There was intense diplomatic efforts, a flurry between Egypt and Israel and the United States to just bring in this tiny amount of help that, again, aid workers say is going to be used up immediately. And we're looking at a humanitarian crisis that is isn't just unfolding on the ground, but is actually being expanded, added to, intensified hour by hour by those airstrikes that continue to push wounded people, displaced people into places where shelters are overwhelmed, hospitals are overwhelmed. That's the fear here, is that this is simply not enough and there could not be enough coming 
in the days in the days ahead. Salma Abdelaziz uh, with the reporting for us. Thank you so much. Joining us now is Cindy McCain, executive director of World Food Program and former ambassador to the UN agencies for food and agriculture. Ambassador McCain, thank you for your time. I want to fill out the picture of thank perspective. You. What was sent in on these first 20 trucks uh, compared to what is needed? So fill that out for us if you could. <coughs> Well, first of all, thank you for having me and thank you for talking about this issue. Uh, we, container all the trucks for medical supplies. Of course, we took in food, water taken in. Um, and as was said, it was a very small amount. It's, it's 20 trucks only. For this convoy and convoys like this to be sustained and to be safe and continue to run and continue to go into the country. This is a catastrophe going on on the ground there. People are starving to death. There's no water, as, as you know. There's no electricity. There's no fuel. Uh, this, this is ripe for disease and much, much more. So I'm, I'm really pleading with the world community to please get in here and help. Ambassador, as you've heard from some of our reporters, especially Clarissa Ward, who's been there on the ground uh, near the crossing, I mean, she's been saying this is just a drop in the ocean because you have 20 uh, aid trucks coming in. Compare that to 450 trucks that have been coming in every single day into Gaza. What is the World Food Program? What are you doing to, um, I guess, what kind of conversations are you having to, to open a sustained humanitarian corridor? Well, I have talked to everybody involved that I can find, and that includes the Secretary General as well as our, our other folks with our various age partner agencies around. Uh, this is something that has got to be sustained and safe, and of course, has to be an, it has to be much more of it. This cannot be the only or the last convoy. It simply can't be. Uh, so I'm looking to, I'm hoping the leadership in the various countries around uh, that surround this can help us I help remind the world that we need to get in here to help those who cannot help themselves and are about to starve to death. What are you hearing from your partners there in Gaza? I understand that there were um, dozens of bakeries that the World Food Pro Program partnered with, and now there are just a couple that are operational. W give us some uh, context on the, um, the capabilities once uh, supplies reach uh, people there, what they can do with them. Right. Well, first of all, we WP was already in Palestine and we were already in the area. And so so we our people are still there. Uh, so what does this mean? We have the capability and the logistics ability to bring in large quantities of food, et cetera. But right now, what's left on the ground, as you know, many of the bakeries were bombed. Many of them just don't have supplies. Um, and the ones that are operational ha have very minimal ability to do just that. We are bringing in emergency food rations right now. This, this is food that people can eat immediately and do not have to cook. Sure. They can sustain themselves a little bit longer until we get, can get the longer lasting items that they need in there. But once again, 20 trucks will not do it. We need, as, as Clarissa said, there are 400 and some trucks going every day. We need those 400 and some trucks filled with food to go in every day. All right. Um, and in terms of your, your message to the people on the ground, because logistically, I mean, I wonder how this is going to work, right? 20 A trucks coming in. There's way more need than that. How do you know how the people on the ground are going to prioritize who gets what? Well, in the case of World Food Program, we we that's what we do. We prioritize. We know where it needs to go. We know where the where the people are also staying with regards to hospitals, community centers, where they've been, you know, where they fled to. So we're going to make sure that the food gets right where it's supposed to go and that it makes it to the correct people. Let's be very clear about that. We have the kind of capabilities to track and trace our food. And more importantly, we are able to, on the ground, make sure that our beneficiaries are the real beneficiaries that should be getting the food. So we're going to do everything we can to make sure it goes right where it's supposed to go. And that's what WFP is good at. We're good at logistics. We're good at this. And so that's why we, we're the largest organization. That's why we continue to do the kind of work that we do. Thank Most. You. 
Go Most Americans uh, first met you when your late husband, uh, Senator John McCain, was uh, running for president. Uh, he was the Republican nominee in 2008. Uh, one of the candidates for the nomination this time around, uh, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, has said that not a single dollar of U.S. aid should go into Gaza. I wonder what your reaction to that is. Listen, it's not just Gaza. This problem is worldwide. We have the Sahel, we have Sudan, we have uh, hundreds of thousands of refugees, millions fleeing into Chad. This is not a problem that's solely in Gaza. This is worldwide. So to say somehow you're not going to give aid to anybody uh, is, is just cruel. Uh, there are people starving to death. And the United States always steps up, is always the first, and we're always the largest because that's who we are as Americans. So I, I would challenge uh, Mr. DeSantis on that, on that topic. Well, thank you for taking time out on a very busy day. I appreciate the work you do. Ambassador Sidney McCain, thank you.